Welcome to Arts Roll Call, a podcast showcasing artists and arts organizations, highlighting the role of the arts today in Greater Lansing. I'm Robin Miner Swartz. I'm an editor, communications consultant, and a lifelong arts advocate. And today I'm talking with Deidre Humphreys Barker, a literary and visual artist and educator. Deidre is the author of Mother of Orphans, the true and curious story of Irish Alice, a colored man's widow. And she's the creator of Blue People, a visual art series on mass incarceration. Her work has appeared in local, regional, and national literary and visual art markets, including Plowshares Blog, Society for the Study of Midwestern Literature, and the anthologies The Beijing of America, Personal Narratives of Mixed Race Americans, and Black Lives Have Always Mattered. Deidre has taught writing and literature at Lansing Community College and Michigan State University's School of Journalism, and her column on education is published in the City Pulse newspaper. Deidre, welcome to Arts Roll Call. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Robin. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me while I try to get adjusted to this camera. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you're the very first author we've had on the podcast. How did you initially get connected with the Arts Council? What made you want to become a member? You know, I like a good party. So I've been going to the first Fridays event for a long time. I, I love Old Town and walking through the galleries, and I always try to bring a friend. And, um, you know, I think of, it wasn't during the pandemic or maybe just before when I thought, well, you know, I should maybe find out something a little, little more about the Arts Council. Because, you know, like you, you know, most um, writers think that, you know, we're not artists. You know what I'm right. saying? It's like we're, we're something different than an artist is a person who makes pictures. And mm -hmm. But I understand that musicians are artists and um, so anyway, I, I started looking into it and, uh, and, and I took out a membership and then I started getting all this information. So <laughs> it just kind of kept rolling like that. Yeah. Well, so what are some of the benefits you found as a writer and a member of the Arts Council? Well, um, like I said, the information, the newsletter, I really appreciate getting that. And, um, that keeps me up on the, um, on the uh, first Fridays, which I love. And, um, and it helped me to understand um, what the council really did. Mm -hmm. And the phone is ringing in the background. That's yeah. kind of a little distracting, but- It's, it's life, it's okay. <laughs> it, it is life, you know, just when you don't want the phone to ring, the phone rings. But when of you course. want it to ring, it, it does not. It doesn't that, and that's true, I think, for all artists, right? Yeah. <laughs> and just exactly. for people in general. <laughs> exactly. So, um, and then, so then, since then, you know, I've been up on the information about the council and the opportunities that are there. And there are- I mean, the council doesn't seem to really make a difference between if you're a writer or a sculptor or a painter or uh, drawn. So I've applied for different things and I've been lucky and um, and got some support from the Arts Council. So I, I, I really appreciate it now. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you discover your passion and talent for writing? Well, that goes way back and uh, to being a kid. Well, one, I could um, I could read really well. We read a lot of uh, uh, periodicals in our house. I'm from Detroit, and every um, newspaper that came out, we my parents subscribed to, including my father's uh, union paper. He was a Detroit police officer. So uh, there was a free press, there was the Detroit News, there was a Michigan Chronicle, the Black Paper, and there was um, a Tuber, um, which was a police union paper. There was Reader's Digest, National Geographic. So I could really read well. And, and, and they tested us um, a lot back then. And my reading scores always came in really high. So it's just a, you know, a short step from reading to writing. They call them like ver your verbal score. Mm -hmm. So that's really how I got into writing. Plus they did a lot of writing um, uh, contests in the schools at that time. And um, one time I wrote about my father, probably the first time I got paid to write. And um, it was for a Father's Day thing. And I won some tickets for me and him to go see 101 Dalmatians. That shows you how long ago that was. That's and great. So he, was so, he was so pleased. He took everybody. And I'm one of 13 children. So we oh, just wow. 
<laughs> so that was a big prize then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It absolutely was. And so one of the questions that, you know, when you go to writers' conferences or workshops, one of the basic kind of questions um, the workshop leader at will ask is, why do you write, which is similar to yours. And um, for me, it, it's to get loved and to be loved. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> Well, your experience encompasses so many different areas. You're writing from, from education to health to cultural identity. What drew you to some of the different topics that you write on and which do you feel most connected to when you're writing? Yeah, you know, it was, I was looking at that backgrounder um, that I got from, uh, from the Arts Council and it, it makes me look like, it get, like I can't stay focused, really. <laughs> no, no, I don't read it that way at all. <laughs> it's, it's just a lot of, you know, and you also do this and you also do that. And um, well, I've been at this a long time. So the topics um, that I write about for primarily were with my, with my jobs, with my career. So I've been a journalist and I've been a, a PR person um, and a publisher. And, uh, and what I would do is wherever I was working. So I, I wrote about that in, in the daytime. And then at the night, I would find other aspects on that same topic and, and write about it freelance. Mm -hmm. And that proved to be a really good um, strategy for me um, to get my name out there and to get more experience by piggy, piggybacking my, um, my employment uh, topic. So like health, I worked at the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's how I got into writing about health. So the thing I did different there was write more about African Americans and the, some of the concerns that I had uh, since I already had background. So that's that's how I came to write about different things. And then you see clearly um, in the City Pulse where I write a column about education. I I draw on my teaching experiences at Lansing Community College in order to get into other um, issues for the most part politics or, you know, scandals that we've had here in the area. And then sometimes uh, just explaining education to the, to the reader in a plain way that when I was a professor, you know how professors write, academics write, uh, I wouldn't, I, that's not what regular people want. So I would, I would explain it in my own way. And, that, and that's how I started writing about a lot of different topics. I would just follow um follow my jobs and it was it was easy to to do that here because michigan state's influence is so big that there is work for writers i mean my virtually my whole career has happened right here in lansing mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Mother of Orphans. And, and for, for those who are watching and listening who aren't familiar with it, can you give us a little bit of background on it? And, and also, how did you learn about the story and what did it take to uncover the history of your great grandmother? Well, we're, we're a big family. Um, and on my mother's side, um, her, her family, we're basically the only kids, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how did I get into it? Just by being interested in in my family. I would go over to my grandma's house and the first thing I would do is pull out her photo albums of which she had many and just sit there and look at the people. I knew there was a story there somewhere, but um, I uh, didn't know what it was. There was something mysterious about, about those pictures. But, and I think mostly because all the people looked different. And um, but but I accepted everybody as our as being in our family, which they were. And um, but how I outline and I tell the story in my book about how I really got interested in it was when my great grandmother uh, died, my mother's grandma, when she died. Irish Alice of the title, and. Um, my mother was trying to work through her grief, I think. And um, one day she came into the girl's bedroom. I, I was sitting there folding clothes out of a basket or something. And she sat down. She had my little sister who was, she was just a baby. Um, this was in 1963. And, uh, and my mother said, uh, you know, um, grandma talking about her mother. She said, grandma was in an orphanage. And I was like, oh, yeah. And she said, uh, 
Yeah, her mother put her there. And um, that was the first that I had ever heard, heard of that. And in just the way that my mother was talking about it, I, I think she was. this was one way she was kind of working through her grief about her grandma dying. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even at that age, I must have been about eight or nine. I knew not to ask too many questions then because, you know, people in, in my family, like many families, are pretty um, closed mouth about mm -hmm. some things. So I was just trying to listen. Mm -hmm. And um, and so she I asked her, well, why why did she do that? And and my mother gave me this kind of long explanation that really had more to do with the 1960s than, than the period in which this event happened, which was 1912. Mm -hmm. What she said was, well, you know, she, um, her husband died, which was what happened in 1912, and um, she needed to get a job, and uh, she couldn't because she had these black children. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the pictures in my book, you could see that, it, um, really, we don't have very many people in our family who look like they're black, like straight from Africa, and my grandma was half um Irish American, what we call white and and African American, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I could not imagine after some years that this that really was the the deal because they had lived openly in in Springfield, Ohio. So why would people be pun punishing this white woman now mm -hmm. after her husband died? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that stayed with me for a lot for for you know it'll be with me my whole life and um I decided after I had children and you know it's like you know I, wanna, I need to look into that because I don't really understand what that was and my grandmother who was a child going who was put in the orphanage she was getting um she was getting old my grandma was over 90 years old mm. um, I started working on that and she died when she was 96. So, you know, I cut it really close there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, to try to, to try to research it and come up with some kind of answer that made a little more sense than, um, than racism. I mean, it might've been, I didn't wait to scale, e you know, either way, but it just didn't make sense for like our family. It just, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So that's mm -hmm. how I got started researching it, going into the census, trying to look at with the places where um, they had lived, reading local histories, going to Ohio, visiting this place. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I, did, I did it all. And I, and I think I came up with a pretty good explanation, make a pretty good argument for what I think happened there. Well, in addition to all of that research, the actual writing must have been an exploration in itself for you. And so what was that process like? And how did you find not just your voice, but the voice you wanted to carry through this story and take that research and weave it into what you wanted to share? Well, you know, the writing process starts before you actually hold a pen or pencil or sit down to the keyboard. It starts with the, with the thinking. And um, and so I I talked to my husband a lot about some of the issues that I have found um, there, and so I was working working through them. I don't know if I I didn't want it to be like a first person um, when I started writing it. First person was all the all the rage, but I didn't really want it to be like that. One because it gets a little confusing. Um, we have a lot of people who have the same name, not my name, but we have a lot of people who have the same name. And um, somehow you got to differentiate it. And I decided to t tell it in the third person. So and to keep it in that in, in a particular time frame that it was happening so that it would be clear to the reader who we're talking about at this time. When I actually sat down to write it, I just wrote in bits and pieces, some essays. The first the first um, iteration of this book uh, appeared in the Ohio um Historical Society's uh, member uh, magazine called Timeline, and and that was back in 2012. And um, because it was such an unusual thing, the editor, when I queried him, it, that editor got right back with me, which is always a good feeling. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's that phone ringing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as opposed to me running them down. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, he was on the phone, so. Um, 
so that's how that's how it started. It started a, in a in a way a uh, form that I understood because I've always written for uh, newspapers and uh, magazines. So it started in a short form and then it got to the uh, longer form. Mm -hmm. And then that, then I was just, you know, as people say, you just kind of writers say, you just write it as it comes to you. And I, mm -hmm. and I um, used a lot of what I learned from my students and from teaching at LCC. I taught writing at LCC for 18 years. And I always tried to make it easy for them so that they could get started. That's really the thing. So, and I would just always tell my students, just start, just yeah. wherever you can, just start it. And then we'll figure it out a little later. Um, but you can't do anything with a blank page or a blank screen. You gotta put nope. something there. So, um, so I, I did that, but now when I was revising it, I had to revise it kind of quick because I had gotten a residency in Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I was, you know, trying to get it in some shape for an editor um, and my publisher to look at while I was over in uh, having fun in Europe. So, <laughs> and then that came, problem to have. <laughs> it, it was a good problem. But then when I got back, she was like, uh, Deidre, uh, we need to go on and uh, go back on this again. And, and yeah. so then it, that was a little more serious. So. <laughs> Yeah, does that answer your question? It absolutely, yeah. It's it's an interesting process, and you know, I I started as a journalist too, and so I think you, what you're describing is the tendency to be writing in short form and coming at it in a very different way, and understanding and learning how to expand and and mm -hmm. take up more space when we're taught to not take up space as journalists. Mm -hmm. That you very concise, so it's uh, it, it it's just a very interesting process of growth as much as anything. You know, you're absolutely right, Robin, because. So we both worked at the Lansing State Journal, mm -hmm. and I worked for Gannett, uh, uh, the owner of the Lansing State Journal in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a newspapers uh, a measure or express how long a story is in inches. Yeah. <laughs> not words. Right. So, I mean, I could tell you the, the story on a daily basis needs to be like this, right? I yep. could tell you that. But I couldn't tell you, I did not know how many words were there. So when I started on this book, um, when I started on this book, I started um, in a class at Lansing Community College at LCC with Linda Peckham. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. She she was my mentor when I went to work there. She's just a great all-around person. She's wonderful, yeah. She is. And... Um, <laughs> I wrote, I wrote like three pages. I was so proud. I was showing everybody in the class. <laughs> Look what I did. They had so, they had so many questions. I left there. It was just filled with question marks. You know, where, where, you know, I had written like it was a newspaper thing. Right, so right. From that point forward, I had to really work on development and getting those questions out the way, while at the same time not boring the reader and um, have it not be just information. And that's when I really started learning about the different purposes for writing. Mm -hmm. And in the newspaper, I mean, now it's a little different, but when I, I was um, writing for the newspaper, it was all about information because I was a news reporter. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, it, there wasn't very much room for uh, any kind of emotion or feeling or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. at, atmospheric um, uh, storytelling. Not, not, it, it, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't mm -hmm. none of that. None of that. So I really learned how to write at LCC. That's, That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, in addition to all of your writing, you're also a visual artist, which impresses me to no end because that is a very different skill set. So can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for your Blue People series? Had you experimented with visual arts before? Oh, you know, just growing up as, as a kid all the time. I, I did collage. Um, I remember this great big piece I did. For some reason, we had like one of those uh, plat platforms and, um, you know, with boards across the top and then, you know, like narrow sides or whatever. And um, and I took all the Ebony magazines and Jet magazines we had. One was one was a picture of Diana Ross. And I just pasted them all to that. I didn't know what I was doing. All I knew is I 
had these magazines and I wanted to make something out of them. Mm -hmm. I also had like this big golf ball graphic, which not very many people saw because I painted it behind a door. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I think the thing that really got me on um, making things was um, I, I sold and I made all my own clothes uh, while I was going through high school and uh, college. I made all my own clothes, wow. uh, my, better, my better clothes. So I'm really, I really am into making things. It's just that you know, um, artists just, well, you know how families are. They want you to be able to support yourself. How are you going to get a job with that, that sort of thing? And so there wasn't a lot of encouragement for um, being a, an artist or really even a, a writer, um, except in journalism, you can't make a living. And um, and so I, so I didn't do, I didn't study it in college. I didn't pursue it very much. It was It was just kind of my thing. So, um, but blue people, you know, people, have, I've been asked that question before, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. it, it started in 2020 and, um, and I just sat down one day and um, I, I was drawn on a, a online paper. <laughs> you know that? That's like not, notebook paper? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just at the end of the table here in the dining room. And um, I think I was mad at Trump. I think that's what it, what it was. Mm -hmm. Because one of those one of those characters was like, ah, like that. <laughs> and um, but I didn't know anything about putting together a, a composition in, of images. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd taken photographs that were published in a newspaper and magazine. So, but, you know, that's that's either like a person's face or you you draw back on them to get a little bit of the context in there, like you're seeing right here behind me. Mm -hmm. And and I interpreted photography as being very different. But this was the first time I had sat down to um, write, uh, not write, draw. I had mm -hmm. you know I hadn't really thought about that. I think I think it's because of Miss Mrs. Haywood, who was my art teacher in elementary school, and she was so. Um, she, she, I mean, I don't know if she was, I don't know what kind of art she did. I don't recall all that. All, all I know is I was very different from her and, and I didn't feel like, um, I could be an artist because I wasn't like her. Oh, mm -hmm. she was very arty, you know, yeah. she had like beautiful clothes and, stuff from her travels and I you know I mean I had nice clothes but I am nothing like she had it was mm -hmm. it was just different so um when in 2020 when here I'm a grown person and I'm sitting down drawing one one we had a whole lot of time you know yeah it's a lot of time and I'm so mad at Trump and it's just President Trump uh mm -hmm. at the time hopefully not again um but and I just started drawing these um, these people. I didn't know who they were, and then some of my ideas started coming out. And they were just people on the page. They didn't have any context or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then I got some support from uh, East Lan East Lansing Arts Council mm. for for it, and, and then uh, to do a couple of shows. I did a couple of shows, and I did a cottage cottage show over here in my neighborhood on the east side. And I showed my arty friends because I just needed to get some kind of advice or something. And to yeah. a person, all of them looked at it and said, oh, that's nice. But where's the rest of it? Mm. <laughs> I was like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> what, what, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. said, well, like, where are these people? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. And and then that's when I had to sit down again and start thinking more about them. And that's when the mass incarceration thing came came mm -hmm. up. So, mm -hmm. well, do you see yourself exploring visual art more? Are there other mediums you'd like to try now? Where is where is your next frontier with that? Well, you know, I'm going to have an opportunity to do that in August. Um, I've been invited to be a part of the artist residency program, an artist residency 
in Flint. It's a collaboration between the African and African American Studies Department. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Ruth Nicole Brown is the department chair over there. Mm -hmm. And um, Gwendolyn Taylor is the program director. And they've partnered with Flint to offer this to um, Black women. And so I was invited to be a part of it. And the nice part, I've never done an artist's residency. I've done all kinds of, you know, writing experiences like that. And in, but in this case, you know, they just gave us a long list of what would you like to work on while you're here? Starting with drawing, painting, sculpture, fiber, photography, and they will give you all the stuff to do it. Wow. So, you know, I think I, when I checked on my form was, um, fiber, because I'm very interested in uh, dyeing clothes mm -hmm. and um, or textiles. Mm -hmm. And I'm, of course, I'm going to do drawing because that's what I'm doing. Although um, some of my artist friends say, you know, you're going to get enough of that colored pencil because you <laughs> you got to actually color those in and it's color those figures in. And it's only mm -hmm. so big that you can get. They were like, try painting. Yeah, <laughs> it's more efficient. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can put more color. It can be more dramatic. I mean, yep. There's some parts of drawing I like, like um, the colored pencil. You can, um, they call it embossing. It's where you really press hard on the pencil and you get this intense color. It gets a little um, shiny on the page, but it's very intense like uh -huh. that. And I like that effect. But they're right. It takes a long time to yeah. do to do a piece. So that's that's what I'm going to do with my art next is go to Flint for a week and and just experiment and look at some stuff. That's great. Yeah. Well, Deidre, what are you working on now? In terms of writing? In terms of anything. <laughs> you have a lot to choose from. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. It's a, I don't know. Sometimes those are good problems to have. I don't right. know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm, I get a little preoccupied with um, finishing, finishing mm -hmm. So, but I am, what I'm uh, kind of excited about is um, I'm doing some writing about the campaign, mm -hmm. Lansing City Charter campaign. That was like, unlike anything I've ever done ever, ever before. And um, so I'm writing a little bit about that and I might turn it into a little chat book mm -hmm. uh, and I have a title for it. Oh yeah. What is it? The title is, I Know Why Obama Smokes. <laughs> And that's why I love that title because people get it and they laugh. Yeah, Camp campaigning is nerve wracking. Yeah, and so you yeah. have to have something, you know. And I, so I do understand. I understand him now. Why, you know, because Obama he's just such a, oh, you know, he gets everything right. Yeah, and uh, when people don't get in his way, and uh, and it's like. Well, but why would he need to smoke? And now I understand because people do get in your work way. But even when they don't, just the whole process of campaigning, all those people you have to meet, all those hands you shake, all those doors you knock on, all those people you talk to, all the money you have to ask for, you have to spend the money, then you have to give away the literature, and then you have to bite your nails while the vote comes in because you yeah. don't. You don't know. You just don't. Mm. I mean, they have different ways. I got a lot of good advice. They have different ways of, of uh, kind of predicting what's going to happen, um, even in a local race and a little small race like we have mm -hmm. had. And um, but still, you don't know. You just, right. don't, you know. So that's why it's nerve wracking, and that's why Obama smokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Deidre, where can folks find you online? Well, you can um, find me at my website. It's Deidre Barker, www.deidrebarker.com. And I've got my publications there, some information about my book. And I actually have blue people up there as well. Mm -hmm. And I can be found at um, Facebook under my name, Deidre Humphreys. And I am also on X slash Twitter, and that's Deidre Humphreys at Deidre Humphreys underscore HB. So I'm I'm do Twitter a little less um, now. You know, when you change the name on something, it takes a while to get used to it. And, and then and then I now I understand why um, business people don't want to be really known because 
then, you know, their clients can feel some kind of way. And that's kind of how I am with Elon Musk. And so I'm back, I backed away from that a little bit, but all my friends are there. So, mm -hmm. and on Facebook, same thing. Yeah. And you have plenty to do otherwise. So you have lots of outlets for your voice. <laughs> yes. Yes, I hope. I do a fair amount of uh, speaking on um, family issues and, you know, some of the issues that come up in my book. Um, but, you know, you want people to know where to find you. And, mm -hmm. and that's it right that's there. Right. On social media. Well, I'm glad you found us today, Deidre. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and to be a part of this podcast. It was really nice to meet you. Well, nice to meet you, Robin. I look forward to seeing you some other time. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This podcast has been a production of the Arts Council of Greater Lansing. To learn more about them, go to lansingarts.org.